Hello and welcome to Happy Horror Time Podcast. My name is Matt Emmert. And I'm Tim Murdoch. Matt and I have interviewed many Scream Queens throughout the years, but today's special guest is a true Scream King. He has the distinct honor of being the only actor who has appeared in the Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and Night of the Living Dead series. Hopefully Matt's favorite franchise, Halloween, is next. But his talents extend beyond being in front of the camera. He's also written directed, and produced many films in the horror genre. Please welcome to the podcast, William Butler! Whoa! Boy, oh boy, you guys, uh, you were walking the razor's edge on that intro. I was like, these motherfuckers are going to call me a queen in the first 30 seconds of uh, the show. Oh I my God. Like, you, did you think we were going to say, we've talked to Scream Queens and here's I've heard it. I've heard it all. I've heard we it We would all. never. Well, well, first off, oh, I would yes, you that would. An, I consider I, uh, that an honor. <laughs> well, you know what? I Listen, as long as they buy a ticket or they buy the book or the movie, you can call me wherever the fuck you want. I don't care. <laughs> I love it. Well, I'm easy. <laughs> I was just going to say, like, we love taking it back to the very beginning. And we read that you had been involved in theater from a young age. So does that mean you always wanted to be an actor? And where'd you grow up originally? Well, I grew up in Central California near Fresno and Clovis, which is right in the dead center of California. And before I started, I did tons of local theater. We had a very, very uh, great and well-oiled mach theater machine in Fresno called Good Company Players. Audra McDonald came out of there. Heidi, Heidi Blickenstaff came out of there. I came out of there. Uh, the, out of the three of us, they're they're far more acclaimed in the theater world than I ever was. But yeah, we but not in the horror world. That's right. They don't have <laughs> that. They can't take that from me. And I'm sure they're glad to let me have that moniker. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, my parents gave me a Super 8 movie camera when I was in fifth grade. And aside from reading tons of Edgar Allan Poe, Famous Monster Magazine and watching Channel 26 there, which had the only money they had was that they bought Hammer films and Godzilla films. So that's really all I did was read Edgar Allan Poe, uh, read Famous Monsters Magazine, read Mad Magazine. Uh, and then my parents gave me the Super 8 movie camera and their life became hell because it was literally all I could think about was – making super eight movies. So I started uh, making film before I started acting. And then I was hanging out with some friends behind this theater, which sounds more salacious than it was just hanging out and, uh, and was being a smart ass and got asked to audition for Annie as the ensemble of Annie. And, uh, and I ended up doing Annie and I ended up doing tons of theater. So I wanted to do it. But I was fat as a kid and I was like, I don't want to be, you know, Pugsley Adams. I don't want to be, you know, I was like, oh, I don't want I don't want to be that person. So it wasn't until I moved to L.A. and started uh, working for John Carl Beekler at um, uh, MMI, which we worked on Reanimator and Troll and all these films that I actually got to set and saw that, in my opinion, it wasn't that hard. And so I got my shit together. I lost weight. And then I. My confidence went up. And so I would say, I, to answer your question in a very long-winded answer, probably around 1982, I decided that I was going to start acting. How's that? Well, we also read that you worked with your parents for a backstage catering company, in yep. a, and you also worked on a carnival circuit. Yeah. What was that like? It was uh, un unbelievable, and it influences every bit of art that I do now as an adult. I We, we catered rock concerts. We did Dolly Parton, Prince, Hall and Oates, a Vanity Six. I got my first kiss from Vanity, actually, um, and many, many, many others. Then we did Barnum and Bailey. We did the food services for Barnum and Bailey. Then we did the uh, carnival circuit in that area um, for a company called Dugan's Concessions. I think that was the name of it. My mother was the main person, so we she hired would hire all of us because she. Couldn't afford a babysitter. So at like 12 and 13, we started working in the carnival and it was like the absolute best time of my life that influences every bit of writing and art that I do. It was a really, really fun way to grow up. Do no, you ever, I mean, having worked on that, were you ever like, you know, fuck acting, I want to be in the circus or anything like um, that? <laughs> not, re not really. I think the one thing that I should have just only focused on the entire time was writing because it's really the thing that I feel I'm the best at writing and directing 
Um, uh, no, I, uh, but, but with that said, just the whole, the whole process of the show setting up and, and, the, and, and everyone being kind of normal and then it being showtime and everyone in the circus being amazing and smiling and winking at you and making you feel special and cool. That really influenced me, the ability to flick a light switch like that and turn on the show and get everyone's money and then turn it off and go to bed, which is basically <laughs> what, what I'm still doing. It's you called know? business. I'm doing it right <laughs> now. In fact, I'm doing it right. The minute we say cut, I will be back in bed with my dogs, kissing them, watching uh YouTube videos. What's my latest search is, uh, well, yeah, UFOs. Flash are you a, are you a TikTok person? I am a TikTok person. I spend like about an hour before I fall asleep watching uh, TikToks. I'm trying to think of what my new thing. You know how it kind of you watch yeah, one the algorithm. Video. Yeah, yeah, you watch one video and it starts sending you. Uh, I like watching old school uh, African American mothers trying to outdance their kids. I absolutely <laughs> love that. That's my new. Wow! Know, everybody, uh, you know, uh, popping and locking. That's my latest. <laughs> that was so, there for a while. It was like flash floods. That was my other one. Earthquakes. <laughs> uh, Yikes! Yeah, weird. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, we we always ask people this also, like, especially people in horror growing up, were you a fan of horror movies? And were there any you remember making like a big impact on you at a young age? Yes. So I was from uh, not to kill your boners, but I was from a not so great uh, family life when I was little. And in order to keep me preoccupied from being, you know, having my head smashed into the drywall and and things thrown at me. Uh, my mother pre, uh, sort of turned me on to horror. She gave me an Edgar Allan Poe book. That's all I wanted to read. She gave me Famous Monsters magazine. So in the moments that I could escape and be on my own, I really fell in love with horror. And one of the, like I said, Channel 26 aired all of the old cool Hammer films. They old, old, uh, aired all the old Godzilla films. And um the first film that I love and still is my number one horror film is a film called The Innocents that is uh, written by Truman Capote, stars Deborah Kerr. It's an old black and white film. If you guys haven't seen it, I highly recommend that you see it. It's a really, really good haunted house movie. Deborah Kerr is a nanny who uh, takes on these two twin children that are English and that are really creepy and adult for as young as they are. And you can't figure out while you're watching it if Deborah Kerr is crazy, if the house is haunted, or if the children are possessed by these two lovers that used to live in the house. It's really weird. Sounds film. great. Yeah. Tons of shots of her walking down the hallway with the candelabra and turning, you know, to scary noises. There's no blood. There's no monsters. But it's really, really good. You can see it. You can watch it on uh on YouTube, uh, if you look it up, it's called The Innocence with the T and the S. I highly recommend it. Yeah, so that was the one. We're not like blood crazy. We're, we will, yeah, we, yeah. We, yeah. Love, we love the older movies that are more about the suspense. Like it's not just gore, even though we also love the slasher series too. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, I'm not a blood person uh, myself. I get, Maybe it's from being in so many movies where I was covered in it. But um, yeah, I'm not really into it. Although I have to say... And I'm surprised I'm saying this, that I really like the Terrifier movies. Huh. Those are as bloody as you get. But I really wow. like, I like the weirdness of it, you know. And it creates a different uh, atmosphere for sure. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. We're getting ready to do number three. And also the guy that plays the clown. I don't know if you guys have interviewed him. Yeah, yeah. we've had him on twice. Actually. Really, yeah. really nice guy. And like really makes you want to support the film. You know, he's really, really <laughs> gentle, nice person for playing S- such an evil. The clown. sweetest guy. And so yeah. it's so funny that like then he like just terrorizes people and brutally slashes them to pieces yeah, yeah, in those yeah. movies. Um, So we noticed going into your first horror movie, I think it was 1987's Ghoulies 2. And in terms of horror connections, which we love always putting these together. And you already mentioned him actually, but we saw that the creatures in this film were created by your Friday the 13th part seven director, John Carl Beekler. So how did you get first get involved in Ghoulies 2? Well, I moved to LA with about $2,000 and two weeks later, I had no money. I was living in my car, sleeping on Sunset Boulevard. Um, and my friend, my childhood friend, Johnny Bullich, God rest his soul. He, John was a very famous Emmy award-winning uh, special effects artist who did all the vampires in Buffy, did Babylon 5, he, he did the X-Files. He, didn't say, he We grew up together. So he came out here first 
And uh, he's like, come crash at my place. And I think I know where I can get you a day job. And so he, I went to John Beekler's shop, which is where jo Bullich was working. And then uh, Beekler was so unbelievably kind. He asked me what I wanted to do, why I was in LA. And I said, I wanted to be an actor. And then he just said, without a without a beat, like, well, then we have to steer you in that direction. And he was the, literally the only person that I met as a mildly attractive um, young male in Hollywood that uh, didn't say he would get me into show business and want to fuck me. It was terrific. It was a great experience. Uh, and, um, and so I started sweeping the floors there, started dumping the garbages there. And then the next thing I knew, uh, he was introducing me to people and you know, I, I helped him in Italy. I worked on uh, Eliminators. We went to Spain. I, I helped him dress the robot in Spain. Oh, oh was, the movie with Denise Crosby? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. I helped dress Patrick Reynolds, the robot, me and Mike Deke, uh, which is I could talk for four hours on that insane experience. We're supposed to be there two weeks and we ended up being there for f almost four months. And uh, then after that, I worked on From Beyond. I was a slime jockey on From Beyond. I painted all the slime on all the hand puppets and on Ted Sorrell's butt. Um, <laughs> and then I helped work on dolls in the shop. And then, and then I got a meeting with Charlie Ban, and Charlie Ban was like, do you want to be in Ghoulies too? And just, yeah, I do. And then he flew me out there and then I just started acting and then, and I didn't stop. I got my SAG card and yeah, it was great. It was a, it, I, we still, to this day, me and my friends, I see Mike Deke often, uh, we talk about how, you know, we were there almost five years between performing and painting slime on people's butts. Uh, we were there almost five years. It was like the greatest time of my life. I was young and I hope they were nice butts. <laughs> Not all of them, but you know, it's kind of like being a doctor. Like you don't even, you know, you're seeing it all. Yeah, I mean, whatever. I, had to, I worked on, uh, I got the hookup and I had to, this is true. There's a scene in the movie where Jeffrey Combs gets his dick shot, shot off and Beekler said, can you go help on uh, I got the hookup? And I said, yeah. And I went to work and they're like, and then I was like, what do you want me to do? And like, you have to tape Jeffrey's junk up between his legs so that they can put the appliance to make it look like his. And by that time, I'd worked with Jeffrey so many times. It was like literally like a doctor's office. I was like, all right, hold still. Let me put the duct wow. tape okay, and pull it up. And that's yeah. a resume builder right there. That's right. I don't often <laughs> talk about that. I don't talk about uh, that one very often because we, 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 we love exclusive. So the scoop. You, yes. <laughs> I taped Jeffrey Combs junk. I love it. I taped Jeffrey Combs junk. So, you know, in Ghoulies 2, your character Merle, he has a really fun death scene because you get stabbed in the leg by the ghoulies, then yes. tied down on a torture chamber while the yes. swinging blade comes closer and closer. And then you get made into a mummy. So I have yes. to ask. What was it like filming that scene and working with the ghoulies who I, I know were puppets at that time? It was really fun. And it, Albert Band was direct directing it. He directed Dracula's Dog, which is one of my cool, you know, fave, sleazy, cheesy uh, horror films. He's also Charlie Band's father. So I was really excited to be working with him. He directed a lot of the Hercules movies, too. I was excited. I was excited to just be included. I was so young and had not really done a lot of things. And, you know, it was just really fun. And the, all the puppeteers were all my good friends. And I'm still friends with all of them. They're all Aaron Kruger is now an executive producer on American Horror Story. She was one of the puppeteers. Uh, John Criswell is the main mechanic at Henson. He does all the insides of the puppets for Henson. Wow. Mike Deke uh, worked for um, what's the Transformers guy, the grouchy one. Uh, Michael Bay. Michael Bay worked with him <laughs> many times. Oh, Bob Kurtzman now is, you know, world famous for all of his stuff. So, yeah, we're all still friends. And, you know, minus John Beekler and Stuart Gordon, all of us are still still kicking. I keep waiting for my number to get called because all, all of my circle is slowly dropping off. No. Don't say that. Don't say I that. Know. Yeah. Well, if I'm dead, you have an exclusive. <laughs> and then the following put me in the, put me in the commercial. <laughs> I won't believe who died right after we interviewed him. No, don't even say that. Don't even say that. The, then the following exactly. year, you joined what is my favorite movie series ever, Friday 13th Part 7. So how was, how did you get involved? I mean, I understand you were working with John Beekler. Yeah. So how did you get that audition? So what happened was Beekler came. He said, I have something exciting for you to read. I said, okay. So I came to the shop. 
He said, go in this room and read this movie. It was a script called Birthday Bash. And I was sitting there reading it. And I was like, you know, there's a guy walking around in a hockey mask killing people that are going to a birthday party. And I was so embarrassed. I didn't want to say to him, like, have you seen the Friday the 13th film? This is exactly like. So I finally said, well, this is good, but it's kind of like a Friday the 13th film. And he was like, that's because it is and, and have you seen the other Friday 13 films? Which yeah. one was your favorite? Which one was your had, favorite? had you seen them at the time? Yeah. I saw the first one at the drive-in. My aunt took me to see the first one. And I was obsessed with both Tom Savini and um, the Friday the, thir- Friday the 13th. And then uh, the second one, which is my favorite one. No, the, actually, the second one's my favorite one. And actually, not because I'm in it, because I'm certainly, if you blink your eye, I'm not in it that much. I do actually like part seven a lot. Those are uh, nice we do too. Look at our yeah. shirts. We both have Friday. Oh, uh, that's good. Wait a minute. Am have... I on? Am I better be on that shirt? Am I, I on... don't know if um, I see Fucker. Tina. I'll have to take a picture uh, because we're audio only. That's a listeners. really good. That's a Thank really good one. You. Yeah, we we pulled out both of our Friday Thirty Part Seven because ah, it's one of our favorite. Ah, it's one of our favorite mine too, sequels. Mine too. Yeah, I love that. I absolutely not. Like I said, not that I had a lot to do with it, but um, uh, yes. So he, I I. I read the script and I was like, okay. And he's like, do you want to audition for it? I was like, I will die if I get in this movie. I literally, literally. I went, <laughs> you will die in this movie. <laughs> I went to, yes. And I did end up dying. I went to the audition. I had audition about seven times, which was absolutely ridiculous. Everybody in town with brown hair and, you know, we all had, I still have Chewbacca hair, but we, you know, we all had that giant eighties hair. They were all there. And I was like, I'm not going to get this. And then I kept going, going, going. And the auditions for horror films are really stupid. They're like, after you do your dialogue, which is like dumb, uh, they'll be like, okay, you're in the woods, you're peeing. And now you see Jason and you're getting scared and you're running. And it's just, I don't know. I By then I'd, I'd been in a couple horror films and I kind of knew what they wanted to see. I gave very good nervous breakdown. And so I just cracked up in the office. They were all sitting there eating ham sandwiches, as I recall. And um, and then I after about seven auditions and uh, going to Paramount, I got the job and I was so excited and also so nervous because uh, if you at that time period, if you were in a Friday the 13th, you were in a working crowd of actors. So I knew all the people that were going to be in it were people that had worked a lot and they were. And uh, I was so nervous, but they uh, they too, a lot of them became really good friends of mine. Yeah, how did they land on the role of Michael for you? There's just it's just such a large cast. Like, did you read for a bunch of roles? And they're like, okay, you're I read. Be this one? I read for like a dopey. There was originally my part was a dopey guy with long hair and like a bandana. That's the first part that I read, and then after the second time I read it, they're like, ah, just you're weird and funny. Just read it as yourself. And I was like, all right. So I read it as myself and then I actually felt better about doing it and they liked me better. So they'd kind of tweak the role for me to just make it, you know, it was, it was a character role. I think nowadays, if I would have read for it, I would have preferred that it be the character role. But back then, you know, I wanted to be one of the cute ones. I didn't want to be by then. I, you know, I just, everyone is dressed so cute and like preppy. I love it. It's it's a lot of young, good looking people in the cast, but you know, as, as Michael, you're the second person killed in the film after your girlfriend, you get a spike in the back thrown at you by Jason and and on your birthday, which really fucking sucks. But um, what was it like filming the death scene? And did you have to film it a second time for when Tina has the premonition of you dying? Yeah, so when I'm getting lifted up in the cabin and spitting up the blood, that was my first shot. It was actually Kane Hodder's first shot as Jason, too, believe it or not. And um, uh, that was filmed in L.A. So we did that part in L.A., and uh, all I did was just pretend to be Janet Lee and Psycho. I didn't really – I never died like that before. So I was like, oh, just reach forward and spit up blood. And so I did that. And then um, – and then when we got out to uh, Point Clear, Alabama, I was a fucking maniac because I, I'd never been on location. I'd never been, you know, this was the first, this is a studio movie. So, I mean, I dove in head first. I was drinking. I did coke. I did all of it. All of the things that you should not be doing. I was just about yeah. to ask you, like, because it was the 80s and like you're out in the, where was the film? Kentucky? Point Clear, Alabama. Alabama. So Now it's wiped like, off the face of the earth thanks to a hurricane. <laughs> what do you do in the 80s while the movie's cocaine. being filmed? Okay. <laughs> well, but wait, were you guys partying in the, because I know the that you mentioned no, there were alligators. Clarify. No, no, no. 
Not you guys were partying. Me and the crew were partying. Really? I had no, no, those other people. I don't think any of them. I can't think of one. I'll snitch too. I don't think any of them. They were all like groomed professionals. I was some hick from Fresno that got, you know, sl- slid under the garden gate and was like, oh, well, you're in a movie. You should be doing coke and drinking. And that's what I did. Um, but then to answer your question, uh, yeah, it, it was me and the. Me and definitely the crew. And uh, apparently alligators? Yeah, were there there were really alligators, there alligators around? There. Yeah. So there was so where I filmed mine, the big where I where I filmed my scene where I was running, um, there was a lot of a uh, deer ticks. So that was the bigger issue. But we also had a man on set, Gator Man, who had a shotgun, who's standing right there, and they're like, if an alligator runs for you, don't run. Just stand still and Gator Man will shoot the alligator. Lucky for me, I didn't see one because I probably would have just dropped dead. You know, <laughs> I think Gator Man should have had a cameo in the movie and been killed by Gator Jason. Man. And then there was Gator Man. And then when I was in Chainsaw Massacre, there was Rattlesnake Man. There's Ooh. always some, some guy with a shotgun in these movies. Th- that's yeah, amazing. It was wild and it was really fun and. Uh, I mean, yeah. And we've heard, you know, so Jeff Bennett, who plays Eddie in the film, called the film Fry Gay the 13th because there were yeah. so many gay actors in the cast. Yeah. So what was that set like? Because I know all the gay actors are out now, but like, mm-hmm. were they out then or was it just like a secret no. between you guys? Mm, no, no one talked about any of that, actually. Um, I mean, we were just there working and acting. And, uh, you know, you have to remember that time period. If you came out as an actor back then, your career was over or you played elevator operators and hairdressers. That was it. Wow. So you had to zip it, you know? And um, and I'm also very private in that regard, so I didn't really care. I'm trying to think. I think me and Kevin Spiritus, hopefully I'm not speaking out of turn, uh, had some dialogue. But we were just like, whatever. I mean, it was just – I was so excited to be in a movie. I didn't care about that element of it. You know, like I said back then, it was a very private um, subject matter that's so yeah. interesting. I'm, I'm happy. I mean, Matt and I are both. And gay, Jeff so. Bennett should zip it because he was, you know, Eddie. He was he was more tight lipped than anyone. So I don't it, know how it's he, OK for him to like come out. And I think it's just because I, I can imagine again uh, that it's just because things have changed. Or I did want to get your opinion, having been in the industry. Like, how do you think things have improved for gay actors over the years? And in what ways do you think there's still room for improvement? I know that's kind of a big question. But well, just I got to tell take. you, I got to tell you. I, as a viewer, don't give a fuck who you're banging at the end of the night. I don't care. And I don't want to hear about it unless you're, unless you choose to be some kind of activist, you know, where you really want to cram it down people's throats, so to speak. Um, You know, when you're entering Billy Porter territory, you know, he's got his thing. He does his thing. Um, But I don't really want to know because I want to watch. There's a few shows that I watch right now where I know firsthand that some of the leads are um, probably dabbling. And I don't really want to know because I want to enjoy I want to enjoy that show and I don't want to be thinking, I don't want to be taken out of the story. So for me, I don't care because that's the way it should be. You should just be a person. It shouldn't be that you have this pink triangle on your arm and that if you're an artist, I mean, do painters, gay painters, you know, write PS I'm gay at the bottom of a painting. No, No, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's also, and it's also, you bring up such a good point because we're spoke, we're buying into whatever the role is in the film. Obviously, I don't want to to ruin it. Yeah. We were watching SAG Awards last night and they were entering dangerous territory. I was like, no, no, don't out yourself. Just write it out. Just have a good time. You know? (laughs) Well, it's like, we also want to imagine that there's a killer on the loose who uh, is the Jason and Voorhees and that's not real so I mean like why can't we just watch people playing their parts and leave it at that you know correct and I'm also very resentful of gay people that f- that get indignant and angry that you don't want to like run up and down the street you know and chaps with a flag I was like I don't uh, what's the point like you know uh, I don't know I, I think there's a, a better way to get people to acknowledge who you are and like you as a person than uh being a little too radical. And I will also say there is a place for that, you know, Mm -hmm. radicalness. There is definitely sometimes a little shock value is good for people that have it coming. But for me personally, I don't care. I'm also, um, you know, closing in on 60 now. So my days uh, in that arena are almost over. I, you know, 
I have, you know, give me a Domino's pizza and a Pomeranian and I'm perfectly good. So now oh, me too. you know what I mean? It's like, I don't have time for any of that. It's too no. much preparation. No, I mean, I feel bad for Matt. Whenever we sit down to watch Friday 13th, like I know it word for word. Yeah. But, so he has to recite like yeah, a single so, uh, line. <laughs> but I was going to ask you, um, what is your favorite scene in the film? And um, do you like the, the telekinesis? Te- how do I say The telekinesis. Thank did, you. Did you. I mean, obviously, if it was one of your favorite sequels, you must have liked it. But do you have a favorite scene? Yes, I like the scene and I I helped on it. I like the scene where his mask splits and she makes the cord come down and strangle him. Do you want to know some good trivia? That's that's me and Mike Deke behind Kane pulling that mask off. So what we did was we we cut the mask and then we tacked it together with uh, cyanoacrylate, which is uh, super glue, just in little dots. And then we got behind him and we ducked down and then Kane just leaned forward and we yanked back. So when it goes, it was uh, pretty miraculous that it worked out as good as it. So I really love that scene. I think it was really well done. And if you guys have interviewed Kane, um, a known homosexual, I'm sure he'll be on the show any day. No, no, I'm kidding. (laughs) Breaking news. I know. I was like, wait, I heard. I was like, what? (laughs) No, no, no. I do no, torture. I, I, I saw this was my very first Friday 13 to see in the theater. And like that whole ending, I, I was like, as an 11 year old, I was like, I love everything I'm watching. Like, I loved it. And you were, you were, you yeah. know, you're we just going to ask about because 11, King Hodder, I've been in rehab three times. You're <laughs> 11 when you saw that? <laughs> Wait, Jesus. so this was Kane this Hodder's first time. is over. <laughs> this was Kane Hodder's first time playing Jason. I know that you um, helped out a lot, like you said, with the makeup mm-hmm. effects and prosthetics. And then we read that you ended up giving him the nickname stinky Voorhees. Voorhees. So I have I to did. ask, where did that come from? <laughs> okay, so in the, uh, the first three days, we were filming both in a swimming pool where he was almost electrocuted. We did the underground stuff. I'm um, excuse me, underwater stuff. And he was almost electrocuted when a big light fell over. And then the other thing is he had to go in that murky Alabama marsh water and swim around in there. So from day one that we were there, that suit, wherever it, it he was, you could smell him from a mile away. It stunk so bad. And uh, and uh, so we would, you know, when you're sitting around and you it, he, once that suit is wet, it's built on a wetsuit. It's really hard to, like, get on. So we would all go and, you know, help him step into it. And uh, ugh, it was gross. Almost stunk almost as bad as Mike Deke's uh, cellar dweller werewolf costume. I would say that's neck and neck for the stinkiest, stinkiest and, costumes. Yeah. And what was it like seeing the movie at the premiere? Like the like I I, I guess it was at Man's Chinese at the time. And did you have a like uh, we read that you had a funny story with your mom seeing it yeah. with you and people <laughs> yelling about your death or something yeah. like that? Yeah. Well, so uh, it was a very. I mean, I can't even believe I'm saying this. Sometimes I'm repeating these stories and I'm like, did that really happen? Am I making this up? Like, you know, I was like 20 something and and a movie I was in premiered at the Man's Chinese Theater. It, to me, it just seems impossible. And so I want my parents to come and we ate dinner at Hamburger Hamlet, was which was at the yeah, time. Right across the street, right? Right across the street. That was a great place. And then we went to the red carpet and we went to the premiere and then they had the little area for us to sit in. And then on the same night, and I don't know why, they had a section of the theater marked off for um, uh, these people that won tickets from K-Rock. And they were all these kind of street kids. Uh, and so when I got killed, some lady goes, fuck him. He's a nerd anyway. <laughs> and my mother stood up like a nice Jew and turned around and went, that's my son you're talking about. <laughs> did, and was there more dialogue or did they shut no. up then? No, everyone belly laughed. Oh, that is it amazing. Was I, I was I'm back in, you know, LA, you go to a movie. That's what you do is you yell at the movie theater. I mean, you yell at the screen. I mean, that's part of the fun, right? Uh, uh, by the way, New York too. I, I'm Jewish too. And my mom would have done the exact same thing. Yes, exactly. Okay, good. <laughs> right. yeah, so, you know, moving to the next in 1989, you were in two episodes of the Nightmare on Elm Street inspired TV series, Freddy's Nightmares. Now, what were these episodes about? And did you ever face Freddy Krueger or were these like non No, I was episodes? just a guy and couple of episodes i was so happy to be in it by that time i had started getting offers so I, you know i don't even remember what they were about one of them was claustrophobia i know that i remember there was a 
getting I don't know something, and then the other one's about gym a haunted gymnasium. <laughs> there, you know, those episodes are very like one room. But we, uh, we, it's like that we used to be able to stream Freddy's Nightmares, but they've removed it from all the streaming services. Yeah, when we were why. researching, we couldn't yeah, watch your episodes. See your episodes. I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you. Because <laughs> yeah. we were like, what happened? And we're like, did he actually face Freddy? Because we know that he was uh, more of like a host. There was Twilight Zone thing. Yeah, it was more like a Twilight Zone episode. Although, was, they, they, there were was such bizarre the episodes. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I hate when they do that. I remember being so excited when they did a Friday the 13th TV series. I was so excited. And then it was just some dumb thing where it's like, oh, you didn't appreciate the antique store. <laughs> In fact, uh, I'm so excited about this Peacock one. Is that even a real thing? The Crystal Lake? Um, yeah. oh, oh, We've heard. So we had a we talked to Adrian King last year before the mm -hmm. strike, and it was definitely a real thing. Uh, since the strike, I've heard ups and downs like it was delayed it's still happening it may happen so i'm not sure but i think it is i think it was just delayed i i was a writer on creep show last season and i wrote something that got some attention and i literally begged to be a writer on this thing and I it was even, the grandma I, episode right yeah yeah mm -hmm. i That's i uh i could not get them to even answer my agent or my email or I was please, I will write for free on the, I have to write on this show. I think the guy that's in charge of it is like a big Friday the 13th geek too. Like there's a guy who's Brian Fuller, right? Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't really know. I don't know his name. I do know he has like a Friday the 13th party every year. Oh, wow. Ooh, I and, I used to get invited and I I used to get invited and I was like, I'm not going to that. And now I regret it. Cause I think he's like an EP now. So oh. I should have gone over there and, and played along with it. But, um, I don't know. Well, there's still hope because it was pushed yeah. off. So maybe. Yeah. Oh, I want to write on that show so bad. There could be seasons two, three, yeah. Two, five. <laughs> yeah. So what's the deal with it? What's the show going to be? I, I all we know is that it's a pre, I mean, they've been very tight lipped is that it's a prequel series about like Jason and I think his mom, Pamela, Adrian King's in an episode. Kevin now, that, Williamson's. Sounds, that sounds dangerous to me. Oh, I have put Adrian King. That sounds very Bates Motel. No, Adrian King. That's great with her. Oh, no. But uh, the idea of like it's when Jay before he drowned. I'm like, I don't know, you guys. It sounds like Bates Motel. I don't know if I like that. We'll see uh, how they I go. Heard. Let me tell you what I heard. What I heard it was, and I was full erection. I heard it was season one was Friday the 13th one. Season two was Friday the 13th part two. Season three was Friday the 13th three. And that they were going to have, it was going to be like American Horror Story where they're either using the same actors or it's a completely different cast. Uh, and now that sounds like a grand slam to me. Wow. Yeah, no, I know. It's clever. I'd I mean, that. I think we would watch anything yeah. related yeah, to Friday the 13th. It. Um, but that's, that sounds cool too. Um, you know, so moving on in your career in 1990, you gave us a double dose of horror with roles in Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3 and Night of the Living Dead by that was directed by Tom Savini. So how did you get involved with both of these films and which one did you shoot first? Let's see. Um, by the time I auditioned for Friday the 13th, I was starting to become the Matthew Modine of horror films. So I got called in on that one by the director, Jeff Burr, who just passed away, rest his soul. And um, I had to read like a hundred times and um, that kept getting closer and closer and became obsessed with it because I was like, I'm one of the Friday the 13th guys. I have to be in this movie. And so I... You know, I was living with Vigo Mortensen at the time, and he was coaching me at, on my appointments. And then I kept running into Kate Hodge at the callbacks, who ended up being the lead, you know, the main star. And uh, we became friends. And I think because we we were having fun with it, but we at no time at no point took it too serious. And there were all these like very famous like. Uh, young people that kept going in and auditioning. And I don't think either one of us thought we were going to get it. Uh, Marsha Cross, who kept reading. And uh, Willie, what's his name, who just passed away, who was on Sex in the City, was reading. Wow. And he had, they both had worked more than, she was on a soap opera at the time. And so I was, you know, I was very used to going to audition rooms and seeing, you know, what's the guy who from Friends? I'd see him on every audition. Matthew Perry? Matthew Perry. No, Matt. Uh, 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 not Joey. Um, um Ross, David yeah, Matt Schwimmer, LeBlanc. Matt LeBlanc. Oh, Matt LeBlanc. If you saw yeah. Matt LeBlanc or David Arquette in the lobby, 
you knew that you were plan B, like for sure. Huh. So I didn't really think I was going to get it. So then they called me in for a final call back and they said, we want to use you. And uh, who do you think? And she had Kate's picture and Marsha Cross, who had gigantic like rodeo hair and like a ton of makeup. And they're like, which one do you think would likely be your girlfriend? I was like, Kate Hodge, Marsha Cross is not going to touch me. You know, Kate <laughs> had beautiful like sort of girl next door thing going on. And then Kate went in and then uh, it was just weird. There was some, so Willie went, it was like between me and Marsha and Kate and Willie and I were all in the lobby. And then Willie went in and then he came out of the audition room and he goes, have fun on the movie. Well, like, wait, Willie, Will, who, Willie, yeah, who? Will Garson, he's in Sex and the City. City. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. And yeah. So, so, oh, so this was for Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So, yeah. um, so yeah. you're saying if you had said, oh, Marsha Cross would do it, she could have been no. your girlfriend? There's no fucking way. She was too, oh. like, you know, too, yeah, hello. <laughs> <laughs> you know, ah, I turned Kimberly uh, from Melrose yeah, Place. Yeah, I, she wasn't I, that. She hadn't toned it down. Oh, yeah. I remember oh, that her. year she did. Um, what was that movie? The Rob Lowe, Bad Influence. She played James Spader's girlfriend uh -huh. that year. Yeah. So yeah, but then later on, her look toned down. I think mm -hmm. she might be older than me as well. But um, anyway, so then Kate and I were who had become friends just from auditioning and belly laughing at all the things that they make you do. We had to go to a final callback with um with Bob Shea and we had to pretend to be driving in the conference room and screaming our heads off. And I was like, I'm never going to get this. And then we kind of left and forgot about it. And then we both found out we got it, which was amazing. So I was so excited because it was a studio movie. It was a new line movie and um, it was just so cool. And then, and then the guy who played Tex, who was cast as Tex booked like a national um Chrysler commercial and he didn't want they didn't want him to be in it because of the obvious because of the gory content so he dropped out of the movie and then I forget how it got brought up and Vigo overheard the conversation he's like I'll do it I'm like you're gonna be in Chainsaw Massacre because by that time he had been clicking he's like yeah I'll do it if 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 they want me I'll do it so I brought it up to Annette Benson and was like um I don't know if you know who this is, but there's this guy who I live with, Vigo Mortensen, said he'll be in. She's like, Vigo Mortensen is not doing this movie. I'm like, he said he would. So they called him. And the next thing you know, Vigo was in the movie. So you have to understand, both Vigo and I did not have a car. So Kate would pick us up in her little rattly car and drive us to set every day. The three of us would carpool to work every day. And it was oh so much fun. It was a total oh, blast. Sounds like wait, a great time. And, wait, so I, I guess I had assumed because I had we had heard that you had lived with Vigo Mortensen for a period of time, but I had assumed you met on Chainsaw Massacre. But you got so you guys were friends, were living together, and then got into the movie. I met I met uh, Vigo on Prison, the Randy Harlan movie Prison, and we became instant best friends. And then that's also where I met Kane, and I helped apply the makeup that uh, Kane wore in prison when he's the dead body at the end. I don't know if you guys have seen that movie. I would highly recommend that you do because Rennie Harlan got Nightmare on Elm Street from it. And a lot of the second unit that uh, that we did for that movie is basically what got him that job on Nightmare. Um, I helped apply the prison makeup and that's on Kane. And that's what got Kane the original Jason thing because they saw he was really good at doing suit work. That's so cool. And I we love yeah. all of these connections. Um, you know, in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, your character Ryan, he unfortunately gets sawed by Leatherface, then strung upside down and sledgehammer yeah. to death. But yeah. so we read something on IMDB trivia, which I don't know if it's true because it's not always true, but I wanted to ask you that before the producers kind of weighed in and wanted changes, the original script had your character being strung upside down naked and then split down the middle. Now, is that true? That's that is true. Terrifying. They, they, I think it would have been cool. I wouldn't have done it back then. Um, I, in fact, I a lot of the stuff I was reading the script, I was such a pussy. I didn't want to do half of it. I just was like, just zone out. And you know, it's a Chainsaw Massacre movie, and that's what the fans want to see. So it was gro It was gross though to me. Like you know, even even. I mean, you know, are you guys actors? Are either one of you actors? I have my SAG card. I've done theater throughout. So you kind of know. You kind of know if you if you switch the pain 
thing on in your head during the take, it almost is like it's really happening if you're really – that's why we're all crazy, you know? We're able to like really manifest it. And, uh, you know, even looking at having those hooks put in my ankles and all that stuff, it really like freaked me out. It was really very real. Also, you're in a room full of fucking method actors who are beating the shit out of you, you know, dragging me around and stuff. And you just got to kind of go with it because they're all really into it, dragging me around by that bear thing on the bear trap yeah. and all that. So it's all very real. Um, And yes, the script was I was naked. It split me down. And then they were unraveling my intestines on like a thing. And oh. uh, at the time I was like, oh, I hope, you know, I didn't want to. And then they changed it. But I think now I don't know why. Why didn't they do it? I, I mean, they were they kept getting an X rating, but I mean that's what the fans want to see on something like that. So we should have done it. You but know. But so you had read the script and you're like, wait, am I gonna have to? Or had they ch- told you, oh no, we're changing this? Like uh, the naked strip. No, I said oh, yeah God. because I was so excited. I was such a fan. You know, I was really living the ultimate fanboy's dream. I had been in a Friday the 13th. I had been in Empire Pictures movie. I had been in another film called Terror Night, which was like a slasher film. And I just was loving it. I just was like so happy. So I would have done anything they said. But I think in the back of my head, I was hoping to get on some kind of serious TV drama thing. So I was kind of starting to get worried that having my intestines pulled out of my body would maybe slow that down, which ultimately t- <laughs> turned out to be true. But, um, uh, but and I then would- came Terrifier. <laughs> right. And now Terrifier and like, they yeah. They stole your idea. Well, they, I mean, have you seen the original Terrifier one where they cut her in half naked, yeah. stuck upside down. So look, Texas, Ch- I wonder, that's so funny to think about. If Texas Chainsaw Massacre had done that with you, would Terrifier had done that? Because, you know, it would have been similar. Who knows? Who knows? Just to think. Well, about. I just got to say this now as a writer, when people rent Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, that's what they want to see. So no one should resist it and just release it unrated. The fans want to see that's a film that you want to see gore, even though the original Chainsaw Massacre, there's not really that much gore. It's mostly this the noise. And believe it's me, disturbing. When running, you're filming and running from a chainsaw, whether there's a blade on it or not, it's enough to give you a nervous breakdown. Oh, I, 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 I was just thinking that because you yeah. have some close calls around the car with the chainsaw. And I was yeah. just thinking that must have been terrifying. Real. That was real. They had some very skilled stunt people. Kane, Kane was one of the stunt people on that show. You didn't have to worry. They were so good, you know. And like I said, it was such a pleasure working with Kate. Kate and I laughed through the whole thing. Kate, actually, Kate and I live together still to this day. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. That's awesome. And Love moving her. on to 1990s her. Night of the Living Dead, this was such a fun remake and you did such a good job as Tom. And speaking of Tom's, this was the first movie directed by horror makeup master Tom Savini. Mm-hmm. What was his directing style like? Well, that was... uh. What was his director style like? Well, he's a genius, and I genuflect to him and bow before him at all at all uh, steps in my life. I love him so much. I'm so grateful uh, that I got that part. I was I went I went with Vigo to go shoot Young Guns too, and I got this audition. This is mind you before email. They mailed me this script for night of the living dead i was like oh here we go again and then i found out it was george romero and tom savino i was like i have to have this so once again vigo coached me and vigo v- videotaped my um my auditions with those big clunky like you know those big clunky vhs things i still have mine <laughs> yeah and then um i got it i can't believe it i remember mailing that tape to them and then Hearing my agent saying, you're in the mix. And I was like, this can't be real. I didn't even meet with them in person. And then I got I got the part and I just was so excited and so honored. And I think for me, I'm very proud of that movie because I think I finally had learned how to act by then. Believe it or not, I'd starred in movies and, and didn't know what I was doing at all. Just kind of copied everything that everyone was doing around me. By then, I understood acting and the nuance of subtext of scenes and stuff like that. And I was really excited um, but, uh, it was a little scary at first because I think Tom saw my audition and really thought that I was a, like Tom, the person, because I did a good job acting. And then when I got there and he realized I wasn't Tom, I think that was a little hard for him to get his head around. I'd never picked up a gun before. I didn't know how to hold a gun. 
I was extremely quiet. Like I told you guys before, I was very private about my personal life. I would show up to my the readings and I go right back to the hotel and hang out with Volich, who was one of the you know zombie makers. And I didn't socialize. I was very quiet. And I wanted to really get my head around trying to be that guy. And I think that um I think that did not work for I don't think that that's what Tom expected at first. So I didn't get a lot of interaction with him at the beginning of the film, but he was never mean to me. He was always really nice, but he definitely was not as chatty with me as he was with the other people. I did, like I said, I didn't even know how to hold a gun and they, they are trying to teach me how to do gun tricks. And I was just some lame from, you know, Fresno who read famous monsters magazine. And I mean, I caught on and I learned how to do it. But you sold it to us. I mean, we watching yeah, the movie you. really believe there's lots of yeah. like, like well, the, the doors up and the hammer. The type of char ca character you were 100 yeah. percent sold it to the us. Happy ending to the story is that years later, many years later, I got a letter from Tom saying I've been wanting to say sorry about, you know, the beginning of the shoot being uh, quiet around you and blah, blah, blah. And, and that made me feel, and I don't think we've ever been closer. It wasn't really like he was never mean to me or never wasn't doing that director thing where, you know, he's making you do a bunch of takes, but definitely kind of not connecting to me. And, uh, and then now we're like really good friends. He, That's you know, great. And you also he's like, you're getting fat, stop eating. And he's like <laughs> that, we're that, you know, we're that close now where it's like, oh, my God, you yeah, you, yeah. you you also worked with um horror legend Tony Todd, a.k.a. the yes. Candyman on this. What was he like to work with at that time? Incredible. All of them. All of them were really good. I remember one of the first scenes we did where all the three of us are there's three or four of us in a circle and we're all talking to each other. And I remember watching them during rehearsal and thinking, Oh my God, I had better step up my game because these people know what they're doing. And I, I don't know. I, after a day, I felt like I fit right in. He is an incredible actor. He's a really funny guy. He's very professional and, I wish him every happiness. I just, I just think the world of that guy, he's so talented. Yeah. Anything he's in, he, it, you know, he raised, raises the bar on him. Yeah. Tallman. I'm still, I just talked to Patty Tallman today um, because of my new thing that my new thing that's coming out, she hel is helping me push it. So yeah, we're still really close friends. And then of course, Tommy Towles, who I was really good Tommy Tolls, who I was really good uh, friends with. He passed away. I miss him a lot. I saw him all. We went to this um, Living Dead uh, in, thing in Pittsburgh, this convention in Pittsburgh. I saw all of them, all of us, except for Katie. Katie's kind of went to Broadway, so she's out of the horror circle for the time being. I'm sure she'll surface eventually. But Yeah. So bef before we exit like the acting portion of career of your career, we wanted to just play a quick little game where we ask you some rapid fire questions. They're not trivia. Don't worry. And yeah, it's yeah. more opinion best based. And you simply need to answer with the name of the horror movie that we've talked about that answers the question best. So basically just answer with either Ghoulies 2 Friday the 13th, 7, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, or Night of the Living Dead. And again, not trivia, just opinion-based. You ready? Got it. Okay. Which of these films have you seen the most throughout your life? Night of the Living Dead. Oh. Which, and this is a controversial one, which do you think is the best overall horror film? Out of all of them? Out of those four, yeah. Probably the Friday the 13th. Kim is happy. To <laughs> Music to my ears. Why, what do you think? We agree? Um, I agree. Well, here's the thing. I love part seven. It's one of my favorite sequels, but I thought night of the living dead was just so good. It just really is such a strong movie. Yeah, and so yeah, I'd say it's, it's a tough. tie between those two. What were the other ones? Ghoulies. T two. Uh, Ghoulies two Are you kidding Texas me? And Texas Chainsaw Massacre well, three. I, I think well, Texas Chainsaw um, Massacre three is good, but it got so sanitized that yeah. the fans got kind of ripped off. You know, the, the ratings board turned it into like a, you know, lifetime movie. Matt and I saw it at a sold out screening at the new Beverly, like, I don't know, a month ago. Yeah. There was really a fun. sold out screening. Yeah. Um, I think which, they wanted us to go to that grandpa. It was too late for grandpa. I wouldn't. Come. <laughs> <laughs> which had the most drama on set while filming? I would say nine of the living dead. Wow. Okay. Which but not on my behalf. Yeah. <laughs> which Some of the gentlemen did not get along on that movie. 
Really? Okay. Okay. It could also be method acting. If you just do the math, you'll figure that out. It could be method, <laughs> it could be method acting. I don't know. I get it. I get it. I, I can definitely tell you that some of the people did not get along. Oh, wow. Well, I will say that ending is so satisfying when she shoots that guy. Yeah. Who's I was an like, asshole he was so whole. mean. Yeah. Um, okay. Which had the most behind the scenes romances? Well, I slept with everyone on all four movies. So that's <laughs> for me to. Um, no, I'm kidding. I didn't. I, you know, I don't. Let me or maybe there weren't I'll any. I'll just give you the dirt. Hold on. Bullies 2. No one was stepping on that one. Um, Friday the 13th. There was a mild amount of canoodling, but nothing to write home about. You know, it's uh, what was the other one? The other one is Texas uh, Chainsaw Massacre 3. No, absolutely not. None. <laughs> and no, Night of the uh, Living Dead. I was sleeping with Vigo. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, and then Night of the Living Dead. Absolutely not. None of them oh. really I hate to tell you. No, okay. that's okay. And which had the scariest villain? In your opinion. Well, I think Jason is the scariest villain. Yeah, I'd agree with that one. Which, which has the most cast members that you're still in touch with today? Oh, my God. I'm friends with, let's see, Ungulis 2. I don't talk to, oh, Carrie Remsen. I'm still friends with Carrie Remsen, who's the lead. On Night of Living Dead, I'm very close friends with Patty Tallman. I'm friends with Tony Todd. And Tom Savini. So that one's three. Friday the 13th. I'm friends with Larry Cox, who played the yuppie. I was friends with Beekler. I'm still friends with Jerry Workman, who did our makeup. So, so far, I would say Not a Living Dead. And what's the other one? Texas oh, Chainsaw Massacre. Well, I live with Kate Hodge. So I think that one wins. <laughs> you got to say, I'm going to say that's has I'm to be. I'm still dead. friends with Vigo, even though Vigo's now, you know, like a superstar. I got to get on his schedule to, like, you know. I have, loved him in the Psycho remake. Yeah. He's on. He's on track. He's a very nice person. And, uh, I would say Leatherface because yeah. Kate is my imaginary wife. <laughs> and which do you get asked about the most by fans? Well, at least two. <laughs> no, <laughs> really? Yeah, more than Friday the Thirteenth. They want to hear me say, "Dude, your tunes, dude, your tunes." Oh my god! I know about the puppet. They honestly, honestly, I get more questions about that than any of them. I'm That's shocked. I'm not shocked good. by any Look, answer today. Kane is a that. whore. Kane is a whore. Everything there is to know about Kane, he's out there telling you already. So no one asked me any questions because he, you know, he's at every convention every single week, and there's no questions. There's no rock left unturned, right? And then Night of the Living Dead, those people are so hardcore. They don't really want to know behind the scenes stuff. And a lot of the fans on that, they believe it's kind of a real thing. You know what I mean? They don't really want to know. And then, yeah, it's mostly, I have to say, it's mostly ghoulies too. They want to know wow. about, you know, I love hearing that. things about that movie. You know, that whole, that whole carnival that was built inside of a soundstage. Satan's Den? Yeah. No, that whole carnival was built inside of a soundstage. It wasn't outside. The rides, everything. Wow. Impressive. So, yep. so, you know, moving on to into the 2000s, you know, you shifted more from being in front of the camera to doing more writing, directing and producing. In 2004, you wrote and directed the horror movie Madhouse. And then over the last two decades, you've written, directed and produced so many horror films, just to name a few for our listeners. The entire Baby Oopsie series, which there's three films and a TV series for Ginger Dead Man 3, Saturday Night Cleaver, Curse of the Reanimator, Demonic Toys, Jack Attack. You and we were we got a chance to watch some of these and you're so good at creating like these like campy creature ish um, characters. And we wanted to know. So what attracts you to that type of horror and what got you into kind of the writing and directing uh, path? No, I think, you know, because I think I have I don't really talk about it on these these casts because that's not what people want to hear. But I have a big I was a writer from Na National Lampoon magazine when it was still cool. I was in L.A. theater sports. I was in comedy sports. I was in National Lampoon live stage show. So I have a giant a big history with writing comedy and I am good at it. And um, I don't know, I think. The only people I knew I wanted to stop starving myself and, you know, for me to in order to stay camera ready, there's like no eating to be had whatsoever. And I just was ready to start like living my life and not being at the gym every single day. And so I knew when I got a job at Fox Family Channel, 
I knew they would give me a shot doing kind of spooky stuff because of who I was. You know, I was that kid in all the horror films. So I, I, I used it as a springboard. And I think just by proxy of being around so much comedy stuff that it felt natural to me to try to interject some sense of humor into stuff. Because you have to also remember in all of my trajectory of my career, I'm always like in a sequel. I'm never like I'm never – I was never in Friday the 13th one. I was in part seven because I was too young when part one was made. And then I was in Chainsaw Massacre three because I was too young when part one. So I'm always kind of, by the time I get to this, this stuff, it's already been done. So you got to be real creative on how you're going to make it interesting. You can't try to remake Texas Chainsaw Massacre one. So I, I just, when they were hiring me, I just brought what I could bring, which I thought was some, in some ways, a sense of humor, but also still making it scary. But I think I'm also good at doing scary things. I think Madhouse is a really good movie. And Furnace is a good movie. And um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's, I find it easy to like in baby oopsie, I did not want to do it. And he, and he's like, you can do whatever you want with it. And I thought, well, he's such a, you know, he loves bikini girls. So I said, okay, I'll do it. If you let the lead be a 500 pound woman, and I was shocked to hear him say yes. And as it turned out, between the two of us, it was a great idea because we had the genius Libby Higgins in it as the lead character. I don't know if you've seen the. I would highly recommend that your viewers and listeners watch it because Lib just for Libby alone because she's so talented, you know. We watched yeah. Baby Oopsie. Yeah, yeah, we did. We weren't. We didn't catch the TV series, but I think we caught um one and two, and she is really good. And it is different. Yeah, it's like it's almost like the final girl isn't what you normally think, right? And as, <laughs> yeah. that, and as that turned out, it was an amazing choice, but it was sh purely by accident and only because I didn't want to do it. I'm so you know I've finally been uh grown up enough to say i'm not i absolutely am not doing any more ham puppet movies or you know i'm such a whore and i love to like i love to create if i'm off work for more than a couple months and you know in the past somebody has offered me something that i wouldn't normally do i would do it because i love being creative and making film and i'm so happy to say that i'm not i'm no longer doing projects unless i'm absolutely in love with it. And I wish I would have done that sooner, but I just, I just like making film so much that it's hard for me to say no, you know, that's so great and, to hear. And, and also like as horror fans, lovers that we are, the fact that you've stayed mostly in this genre as you're writing and producing is so cool because like, you know, like you said, everybody knows like the movies you were in when you're an actor, but like sometimes people use horror as a springboard and we love it when people stay within the genre and truly love it and embrace it, which you've done, you know, throughout yeah. your career. And what yeah. do you enjoy doing more, writing, directing, or producing? I like uh, I like writing the best. Producing, um, I'm good at, but producing requires being a prick, and I'm also good at that. And so I don't really I don't really like it because everyone hates you. You have to say no a lot, and uh, the director usually absolutely hates you. I could list five people that I imagine are probably listening to this and you know drawing satanic stars on the screen of their computer because i've had to be so firm with them firm is a very polite way of putting it um i'm good at that and then uh and directing i love directing but i don't you know from the horror world we're oftentimes expected to direct 18 to 25 pages a day and i get you know i'm not young anymore i get tired i just got through producing uh this film um, where the, the the director was released and they had me take over and direct for the last five days. And it was such a pleasure because the schedule only had five pages a day. And I just really, really love that. So to answer your question, I love writing the most. I think that's my most strongest thing. Um, and then next directing and I will hooker and produce cause I like money, but I don't, I don't like doing it. I always warn the people ahead of time that like, you're going to hate me by the end of this. Cause I'm good at it and I don't like to spend other people's money, you know, especially when my head is on the chopping block, but I like, yeah. I like writing most. No, that makes sense. Yeah. So, you know, speaking of currently, we've seen you post about two current projects that you've been involved in. We wanted to see, you know, whatever you can tell us about them. The first was, I think a film called hour of the dark shadow. And the yes. second, Wait, um, how did you know that? Did I tell you that? Uh, no, no. I uh, saw it on Facebook. Um, you posted that you just wrapped. Okay. Well, and I'm then, glad you remembered the title because they just changed it. And I often, I mangle it and everyone laughs. Uh, at me. 
<laughs> well, and then the second, um, a series of graphic novels called Terraphilia. So yes. what can you tell our listeners about both of okay. these projects? Okay. We're excited about them. I'm, I am excited about them too. Um, the first one is a film that's very bizarre. It almost has like a foreign vibe to it. It's about a guy who owns a movie theater in the 30s and he gets a curse put on him. And uh, this certain movie that plays in the theater has a curse on it. And anyone that goes to it um bad very bad things happen it's really weird it's really different and um i think it's going to be really good i was literally helping um do the paper cut for the trailer this afternoon and i'm very excited about it uh my partner carolina uh brazil uh is a new ep that i'm going to be working with in the coming year i have several projects with her which i'm really excited about She's a really cool person and a big deal. And the other thing, which is just so much fun and I'm so proud of is, you know, like we talked earlier about writing. Um, I love writing so much. And so there's been some screenplays that I really, really love that for one reason or the other, mostly because it cost too much money to produce them, they didn't get made as uh, movies. One of which is a film called Circle of Six, which is a... Uh, story sort of reflective of the fog maybe a little hellraiser thrown in there about a coven of witches that's put to death and something happens and they come back to this like massachusetts town to like kill all the relatives of the people that burn you know burned them alive oh i love it I love it right <laughs> i love witches and i love revenge stories i know i know i know <laughs> exactly why didn't they make this movie so my friend Brian Gage, who is a novelist, he's very well known for writing vampire novels, um, and he's been doing graphic novels. And he's like, do you have some stories that you would like turned into a graphic novel and I'll do the artwork for? He does a very beautiful, seamless blend of hand-drawn. He does some AI backgrounds. He does some 3D modeling. Um Photoshop, he does all everything. He puts it all together, makes it so beautiful. And um, we took the script and we broke it down into comic book form. And he did all the artwork. And then it turned out so good. I'm not just saying this. I don't care if you buy it or not. I know you will, though, because it's really good. Um, uh, it turned out so good that we're like, oh, we got to create a label. And I was like, yeah, let's do that. It's time for a new, a new sort of Tales of the Crypt kind of vibe label. So the first one that we're releasing, which is called Circle of Six, is a two issue. I think they're like 100 pages each of this story, Circle of Six, which is a screenplay turned into a beautiful graphic novel. And then then we'll really well, that's going to be available in April. Very, very affordable, either electronically or they're not expensive at all. And um, and then after that, even more exciting, we're launching this uh, Terraphilia short story um, series where we're going to do 13 short stories that are like, I think, 40 page um, graphic novels hosted by this sort of Frankenstein, sexy Frankenstein host, which I'll send you a picture of. She's really cool. She's kind of like a combination of an eyedropper of Elvira, an eyedropper of Crypt Keeper. She's really sexy, kind of a, a little Annie Fanny. And if you two are probably too young to know who that is, she was kind of a, a buxom uh, beauty from Playboy magazine. And she's the host. It's not unlike Crypt Keeper, where she hosts, you know, hosts the story. And we're doing short stories, self-contained short stories. I had so much fun writing on Creep Show that I just could not let. I couldn't stop doing that. So. He and I are writing the short stories. We're also accepting short stories. So if people um, look me up and they have an idea and it's something that I think we can um, work together on, I will – you certainly don't hesitate to hit me up. If you don't hear from me, that means it's not going to work or and or we already have something that's close and I don't want to like steal your thunder. So uh, – but I'm really excited about that. It's very – you know, writing – Writing is something that's just so satisfying because no one's telling you what to do on it. It's the best. You're not – doesn't cost anything to do it. And, uh, you know, Brian and I just email each other back and forth and we tweak the drawings and the paintings and the all of it. It's just so, so much fun and I just absolutely know my fans and maybe some new people that don't know who I am. If you like to read or you like really cool, you know, 
witchy stuff. You're going to love this. It's really exciting. My book, you know, my first book that I wrote, which I have right here, I'm going to show. Um, my first book. Ah, oh, it's not going to let. Oh, me is this this is this some tawdry uh, tales and confessions uh, yeah. from Horror's Boy Next Door? Put up my face. There it is. Yes, yes. Anyway, uh, it was a bestseller. And uh, I didn't even try on that one. So I'm really trying on this to get people to to look at this. Um, the horror world is changing and there's so much room for all kinds of creative uh, media. So I'm really excited about it. It's not a money grab for me. It's something out of passion, which is exactly why I know it's going to succeed because I just love it so much. Well, that is so cool. We, look, we we wish you nothing but the best with all of that. It sounds really awesome. Maybe, who knows, if um, Circle of Six does well as a graphic novel, maybe they will make it I into know. a That's movie we, or a show. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, we, we, we're, we're thinking that it will take illustrations for some nitwit studio executive to go, oh, hey, this would make a great movie. It's like, yeah, like three years ago when the script was bouncing all over town. But it's <laughs> no. filled with a lot of effects. So whoever would do it would have to do it responsible before I would let them. Tom Savini. <laughs> yes. I would say yes, 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 and yes. <laughs> well, so Circle of Six and and the, the first two um, um, graphic novels come out in April, you said? Yeah. So the first... Part one comes out in April. Part two comes out in May. And then I think the next one will probably come out in July, the short stories. So excited about that. And we're going to be um, doing appearances where we're going to bring this character with us. And it's going to be a blast. I'm like so looking forward to it. And then Hour of the Dark Shadow or whatever it ends up being named. Just, do you have an idea of when that would Halloween. be? It'll be out in Halloween for sure. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, it's going to be cool. Well, that is so cool. Like, we're seriously, again, like I said, like we we love that you've stuck with this genre that we love so much that you've become known for. And like, I think passion projects are the best because like you're, you're doing what you want to do and people can tell, I think, I don't know, I feel like I can watch a movie and tell if the director truly believed in it and loved right. it versus they were just doing it as a job. 100%. You know? And on my work, you can certainly tell if I'm phoning it in or not. Like, huh. you know, for sure. For absolutely for sure. And that's why I'm saying about this thing. I won't make any money on that graphic novel series at all. You don't make, I mean, I made $7,000 my books, my book sold over 7,000 copies and I made $7,000. You don't make any money on books. You certainly won't make it on a, on a, on a 50 page graphic novel, but I don't know. It's just so much fun to control the, you know, control every aspect of it without a studio telling me what to do that it's I highly recommend that your listeners dabble in all of that because it's really fun, you know. Definitely. Um. So before you go, we have one final question for you. We ask this to everyone that we interview, and you've actually kind of given us a few tidbits that would count as the answer for this anyway. But um, what is one thing that you can tell us about your experience working on any of the horror movies we discussed today that you've never told any other interviewer, any other publication, any other podcast host, any other convention Q&A, just one thing about any of the horror movies that you have never told before. And it doesn't have to be like the, you know, the most gossipy it can just be anything. Um, it's just be like, oh, one day, uh, uh, we had a flood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or it could be gossip, but either way, like just something that you've never told about one of the horror movies we talked about today. The alligator bit someone's finger off. <laughs> I'm trying to think of something I didn't put in that dirty book that I wrote, but let <laughs> me think for one second. I'll think of something. I slept with Kane Hodder. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I was like, well, what? Yeah. <laughs> Thinky <you>, Voorhees? <laughs> yeah, no. That could not happen. Uh, I got slapped in the face by Klaus Kinski in Italy in like 1988. Oh my because gosh, that's the guy he, that was in Crawl Space? Yeah. Yeah. I made fun of him because he was whining about climbing in a a hot air conditioning vent in Crawl Space during Crawl Space. Oh my gosh, I've seen that movie. It's really he scary. Slapped. Wait, he you were wait wait, so you were making fun of him I've been for... slapped a, I've been slapped a few times. That time Klaus yes because all right, I'll tell you the story. So when they were making the film, there's a, they had this fake air vent that he was crawling around in, and they had all these 10K lights. It's before, like, LED lighting. So he was crawling around in the vents. I wasn't there on this part. Um, and he was getting hotter and hotter, and he couldn't breathe, and he just started screaming and, like, holding his skull and going, I'm not a hamburger! I like, screaming. And... Uh, 
And then so Stuart Gordon told me, you're not going to believe what happened. Like, Klaus lost his shit and uh, and uh, was screaming, I'm not a hamburger. And we were walking back to the to the the, the bar in the Italian studio. And I saw his dressing room. And I tried to make Stuart laugh. So I screamed, I'm not a hamburger, like by Klaus's dressing room. And all of a sudden the door like flung open. And Klaus Kinsey comes out and just runs around, slaps me right across the face, like a slap that you'd never forget. And uh, and then I ran and Stuart belly laughed and went one way. And Klaus chased me down the hall. And I don't know how I figured it out, but I ended up in the hallway that went to the elevator up to Dino De Laurentiis's office. And I managed to ditch him. And the next day, we I was nervous about going to the studio and um I went to the studio bar and was drinking coffee. And one of my friends from the movie that we were working on, I think it might have been Arena, was like, uh, somebody's staring at you. And I turned and I looked and it was Klaus Kinski. And instead of murdering me, he just looked at me and went, he shook his finger at you. Yeah. Wait, wait. So did I guess was it okay for people to slap people on, on set? Oh, my then? God. Like Are you kidding me? I bet I got slapped one time when we were working on Cellar Dweller and a grip walked by a light and his belt got caught on the light and it fell over and broke. And Pino Brutti, the producer, came running out of the set and thought it was me and ran up to me and slapped me. And, and that's just OK me. back then. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I'm going to look at Crawl Space a whole new way. Yeah. Yes. That is. And were you did you ever did you like apologize or did you kind of ride it out with Klaus or were you just like. No. deal with it <laughs> no he slapped me so uh yeah i, I mean, mean he was scary yeah and he never I mean, apologized he, like bullying me will get you an eyeball full of like liquid drano like i don't i don't apologize i mean you slap me like i mean yeah i'm surprised i didn't like poison his you know coffee or something but and he never okay. apologized he never apologized to you he barely spoke english yeah no he was a hamburger he's yeah. not a ha he's not a hamburger, hamburger. <laughs> it's the best story that is I hilarious love it. we love there's it there's so well, many weird stories from that italian uh, movie studio i highly recommend you can i'll get a dollar if you buy it uh the tawdry tales and confessions of horace boy next door there's a ton of stories in there there's one where yvonne de carlo got mad at me and Tom Sizemore threw a lit butane heater at me and Prince threw uh, a tray full of cashews in my face when I was little. My parents were doing catering for him. There are crazy stories. Wait, wait. Why did Prince throw cashews okay. at you? Okay, So I know I've been talking too long, but I'll tell you this story really fast. So my parents used to do backstage catering and – Part of the selling point for me and my sister to help her, because we were like, I was 13, so that means my sister was 10, we would get to go and carry the food back to their tents where the celebrities were, which was such a dumb idea because we even did like Van Halen and stuff where they were like partying, you know, fucking girls and doing blowback there. But we we didn't care. We just thought we we're so happy to be around the celebrities and Prince was just now coming out where people knew who he was. And my mother put us in little white shirts and little bow ties and little aprons. And we got to push these food carts into uh, Prince's tent. And I was scared. I was, you know, well, how old was I? I was so young. I had a, uh, the Brady Bunch had just gotten perms. So I got a perm because I wanted to look like Greg, Greg Brady, but I weighed about 200 pounds at that age. So I, I looked more like a cherub or a person wearing a, a motorcycle helmet made of curls. And I was a little fatty pushing the car. And then my sister was always like sort of butch and aggressive and nothing scared her. So she went in pushing a little cart and then she went in and, uh, and I had to wait and she put the food down. It was like tarts or some dessert thing. And then I remember my sister came out and she was like, he's wearing high heels. And I was like, what? She's like, he has makeup on. He's wearing high heels. I was like, wow. So then these rock stars have a thing called a rider, which tells you the things that they want and that they don't want. And on Prince's rider, it said a tray of warmed nuts, absolutely no cashews, bold and underlined in his rider. Well, yeah, no, it, uh, the cashews ended up on the tray. So I pushed the cart into the room, into this very chic tent that they had built at the Selland Arena in Fresno with incense burning. And it smelled like uh, 
oh, why did I forget that feet ladies perfume? It smelled like perfume in there. Prince Machabelli, that's what it smelled like. And then I, I pushed the card in there, and there is Prince draped on this purple couch in high heels and a waistcoat and full eyeliner and just laying there, you know, drinking a cocktail and all these like people kissing his ass and stuff. So I'm trying, you know, my mom had this rule. It's like, you don't look at them. You don't make eye contact. You don't do anything. You act like you can't see them. You go, you put the food down and you leave. I was like, okay, don't interact. So I go and I pull the tray out and I put the tray on the catering thing. And then I get the nuts, the warm nuts on this tray. And then Prince goes, Hey, I go, yeah. And he goes like in the coffee table in front of him. And I go, okay. So I go and I put the tray down on the coffee table and then I'm like, I didn't look at him. And then I, I turn to leave and he goes, stop. I stop. He goes, turn around. And I turn around and I look down on this tray and there's cashews all over this thing. So I just stay there and he goes, come here, stand right there. I go, okay. And one by one, he flicked every single cashew off that tray into my fat little body. Boom, boom, boom. And then right after about the 10th one, I hear, Prince, stop. And we all look at the opening to the tent and it's Vanity. Now, Vanity Six was a very popular girl trio band that Prince had created that was opening for him. They were very beautiful. Denise, I think her name was Denise Richard? Denise... <laughs> Something. So <laughs> real no, something okay. like that. She was this pretty African American girl, pretty quite pre, quite possibly the prettiest girl I'd ever seen. She's wearing like a white lingerie and she has a big wig with all the sparkles all over it. And she's like, "Stop!" And then she said, "Come over here." And then I came over. She grabbed my big fat face. She said, "Don't you ever let anyone do anything like that to you ever again." She said, "What's your name?" I was like, "Billy." And she goes, do you understand me, Billy? And I go, yes. And she opened <laughs> mouth, kissed me. I got my, it was my first kiss. She kissed me on the mouth with tongue. And I was like stunned and like w w staggered out of the tent. And, uh, and uh, I went backstage. <laughs> And then I was with my mother. I burst into tears. And my mother goes, what's wrong? I go, that lady out there kissed me. My mom was like, what? what? So uh, that's that may, a story. I got my first kiss from Vanity. That that's may be the most story. insane story I've ever heard in my life. I don't know what's more insane. Prince flicking nuts yes. at a kid. Sure or, or I take sure it did. Vanity was what? How old was she in her 20s? And her, she was probably in her 20s, yeah. She open was open mouth kissing a 13-year-old. <laughs> yes. She open mouth kissed me. And for that very wow. brief shining moment, I was as heterosexual as I would ever be. It was terrific. Wow. I, that I was, is a great wow. story. I girls are cool. I'm so in shock. That's just the yeah. craziest story I've ever heard. I love that. Oh my God. Thank you for sharing that with yeah. us. So there's that. <laughs> but I've told yeah. that story before, but oh, yeah. but that's okay. Um, well, yeah. look, again, want to thank you so much. We've had such a great time chatting with you. Thank, thank you for you. like going back in history, talking about all these films, talking about your new projects. We're very excited for you. Want to help you promote them and wish you all the best for them. Yay. Well, right, thank you. Guys. Yes, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Yeah, we had a great time and wish you the best. We'll talk to you soon, okay? Okay, thank you for including me. Of course. Okay, okay. take care. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Happy Horror Time. This podcast is hosted by Tim Murdoch and myself, Matt Emmer. It's produced by Jacob Randall. You can listen to the podcast directly on our website happyhorrortime.com or Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever you stream podcasts. We release new episodes every Monday. The first Monday of the month is always an interview with a horror star, and every other week we review a new horror film. Now, our reviews do contain spoilers, but you can check out our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter slash X social pages the Friday before release day to find out the movie we'll be discussing. If you'd like to contact us, you can send an email to happyhorrortime at gmail.com. 
And if you'd like to support the podcast, please sign up to be a patron at www.patreon.com slash happy horror time. Patrons get access to our monthly bonus episodes, yeah. all our regular episodes ad free and a day early, our monthly newsletter, the ability to vote at our polls, and Tim, are you ready for this? Autographed, Autographed Happy Horror, horror time, time stickers. I'm Tim Murdoch. And I'm Matt Emmert. And, and we, we hope you have a happy horror time. time.